And on this episode of Travelog, we're going to take you on an adventure as perilous as it is fun. We're going to be retracing the fabled tea and horse trail. We'll be heading to the legendary Shangri-La and its iconic Sonzan Lin Temple, followed by learning how to make a cup of buttermilk tea in the house of a Tibetan family. There'll be some horse riding, wine tasting, and plenty of other stuff as well. So enjoy. Witnessing the hardships of the pilgrims to Tibet, escaping through Death Valley, and listening to hymns in the most remote church in China. These are some of the highlights of an amazing adventure along the 1,500-year-old Tea and Horse Trail. Travelog takes you on a legendary and perilous journey, joining a modern-day caravan as it winds its way among the rugged mountains from Yunnan to Tibet. It's a journey through a land of almost untouched culture and natural beauty. Retracing this fabled cultural and economic lifeline in China's history, join Travelog on a three-part series, Adventure on the Tea and Horse Trail. The Tea and Horse Trail, a trade route first trodden 1,300 years ago, begins at Puar in Yunnan and ends at Lhasa in Tibet. Over the centuries, tea, horses, and many other goods have made their way onto neighboring countries. The trail winds its way among some of the highest mountains in the country, where landslides and heavy snow are just some of the constant dangers. There are few other routes for cultural and economic exchange as perilous as this one. Hi, welcome to Travel Log Special in cooperation with Trends Traveller. I'm Mark. And over the next 10 days, we're going to take you on what is arguably one of the most notoriously high, adventurous, and perilous journeys known to man, namely the Chama Gudal. This is the Tian Horse Trail, which was established over a thousand years ago. I'm here in Shu He, which is our first stop, and we're going to go from Lijiang all the way up through to Tibet. I can promise you that on this trip, you're going to have adventure, mystery, and hopefully a hell of a lot more. See you later. Our exploration of the Tea and Horse Trail begins with the Qinglong Bridge, the symbol of Shu He. Built 600 years ago, it's the oldest bridge in the whole region. It's also a fine place just to sit and watch the world go by. Shu He is a peaceful place where time doesn't just stand still, it actually seems to be flowing slowly backwards. A crystal clear waterway zigzags across it and disappears among a cluster of ancient buildings. When you see how beautifully preserved the place is, it's hardly any wonder that Shu He has been included by UNESCO on its World Heritage List. The leisurely pace of life creates a unique sense that this is somewhere that time forgot. This part of Yunnan is home to the Nasi people. One of the many interesting things about the Nasi is their women, who are known to be hardworking and resilient. As the sixth stop on the Tian Horse Trail, the men of Shu He would often be away on the trail, which we can still see today. Check out this cool shop. Wow. Now, how old is that? That actually looks like something that the Chama Gudao might have had and put their tea in or something. So maybe this shop has got more stuff. Let's have a look at that. What do you reckon this was? It's probably really dark at night, so they'd be looking around. This would have come in useful. This would be one of the things I would have taken. Good choice. A title you hear mentioned a lot here is Ma Guotou, the head of a caravan. He has to be both strong in character and in body if he's to manage a caravan along this long and arduous journey. Often, he'd use his own horses to carry the merchant's goods. Throughout the history of the Tian Horse Trail, the Nasi people produced more than their fair share of Maguoto. So if we're going to meet some of these legendary figures, Shu He is obviously a place to look.
these walls really look very, very worn out. It's quite something. Can't believe there's not really much space for the horses here. Oh, bit of a new door there. Bit of a new door. So uh, they've had a bit of renovation, haven't they? Let's go check out the rest of the house. It was quite surreal waking up in the beautiful surroundings of this peaceful, ancient town. It felt more like being in an alpine village during the summer. People were slowly going about their daily business in much the same way as they have for hundreds of years. I've managed to get some information about a Magwoto, and so we're off to see if we can meet him. Grandpa Jang, now 83 years old, is still working. Although these days, he's running his own business making caravan accessories like this genuine mobile phone holder. He was 12 when he set out on his first journey along the Tian Horse Trail. Nowadays, people come from all over the world just to listen to him and to buy some of his goods as souvenirs. But I'm more interested in his first-hand experience that he recalls as though they happened only yesterday. <laughs> Six thirty in the morning. This is our first day, and there's a high level of excitement to match the high altitude. The people from Trends Traveller are checking every last detail: the food, the cars, the oxygen. That's no surprise with a convoy of 21 cars and 83 people to look after. For most of us, this is the trip of a lifetime. Whether we come for the culture, the scenery, or even romance. At last, we're off. We've all been warned about the potential dangers that lie ahead on this long journey. The weather can be unpredictable, the winds may be high, and there may be landslides. Let's not forget, there is always the possibility of succumbing to altitude sickness. It all adds to the excitement and even the fear. But surely there can't be anything to worry about at our destination today. Shangri-La, which I only know from James Hilton's famous book, Lost Horizon. According to Tibetan Buddhist scriptures, a Shangri-La is a place where human beings, animals and nature live in perfect harmony. And this is a pretty fair description of the Shangri-La as it appears in James Hilton's book. Ever since the early years of last century, Shangri-La has been an important business and transportation hub on the Tian Horse Trail. Culturally speaking, most people here are Tibetan Buddhists. In a place blessed by Mother Nature, where the scenery is so incredibly beautiful, Tibetan and Yi people have had no trouble making a happy home for themselves. Well, I'll tell you what, two minutes ago, I had my sunglasses on. Well, probably about five, five minutes ago, I had my sunglasses on. And it's now raining like hell, really raining hard. They say that the weather in the mountains is uh, much like a monkey's face, ever-changing. For the last few hours, we've had sun and rain, rain and sun, as if the weather can't quite make up its mind. 
But then something happens that really brightens up my day. We chant upon a group of Tibetan girls singing and dancing at the roadside. The old maxim rings true. The Tibetan can talk, they can sing, and if they can walk, they can dance. How oh, they're not tired is absolutely beyond me. <laughs> That was really the most tiring thing I've done in about probably 26 years. Uh, and none of them, they're, they're not, they don't even look tired. They don't even look tired. Look at me, I'm, oh, I'm getting old. No sooner do we arrive in Shangri-La town than we're whisked off to the renowned Tsongzhan Lin Temple, a magnificent lamasery carved into the hillside and the largest Tibetan Buddhist temple in Yunnan. This is going to be my very first glimpse of Tibetan Buddhist culture. I find myself being lured up the stairs by the melodic sound of a beautiful voice. Oh, so I've made it to the top here at the Tongzhan Lin Temple, also known as the Small Patala Palace, which is extremely important in uh, Tibetan Buddhist religion. And apparently, they've got jewelry that's been collected over hundreds and hundreds of years. Built in the 17th century, the Tongzhan Lin Temple is a treasure trove of cultural relics, including eight gilded Sakyamuni statues over 200 years old and a collection of Tanga scroll paintings in golden ink. This temple is home to more than 700 Buddhist monks. Buddhism became a major presence in Tibet towards the end of the 8th century. To Tibetans, Buddhism is more than just a religion. It's a philosophy emphasizing compassion and self-sacrifice. Children as young as five are sent here to become monks. This place is pretty empty right now because we're here in late afternoon. But if we came here at 8 o'clock in the morning, we'd find over 100 monks congregated talking, debating, and exchanging ideas about Buddhism. To, to reach the highest level, which is the equivalent of a doctorate, you'd actually have to really, really have a deep knowledge of Buddhism. So they come here, they walk around, and they ask a question like this. So you say, ask a question. If you want to take the question, you put your hand up here. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Ooh, this looks like somewhere that... Ah, here we go. All money buy me home. Tibetan saying to bring me peace and good luck. And uh, so I'm going to put a bit of money in here and hope the Buddha brings me good luck too. Not far from the Lama Street, I come across a Tibetan farm. Now, this is my chance to see what life's like for an ordinary Tibetan family here. Time for some butter tea. Miha. Hey. Hey. I've uh, very kindly been invited into a Tibetan house. We're still in Shangri-La, but I was feeling a bit cold outside, so saw the fire coming out of the top. Thought, come in here and try the famous buttered tea milk. Buttered milk tea, even. Sorry, try that. Yeah, sure. Sure. Suyu cha. 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 Give it a go. Oh, that's uh, warm and uh, probably something you should come and try yourself. It's, uh, it's, got, a, it's got a very specific flavour. Yes, 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 yes. No, Yoma. Just a little. Just a little. Look at that, we've got, we've got the whole family here. <laughs> They're all going to teach me how to do this. 1400 or so years ago, Tibetans got into the habit of drinking black poor tea. It quickly caught on, 
because they found it helped digest the meat and milk that constituted what was a pretty heavy diet. They often mixed the fermented poor tea leaves with yak butter, creating a salty, rich liquid. So now we know one reason for the popularity of the tea and horse trail, the Tibetans thirst for tea. The father tells me he drinks on average six or seven cups a day. <sighs> it takes, as you can see, a lot of effort just to make that little cup of tea over there, so uh, I'm going to probably have to drink a bit more, which is fine because I made it myself. I don't think I'll ever forget the generous and heartwarming welcome I received from the Tibetan family. The whole family live together on the farm and raise cattle and grow barley. I discovered later, though, that the father himself worked on the tea and horse trail years ago. In fact, most of the older men in these parts have earned a living in one way or another from the trade route. I'm delighted to have had an actual taste of Tibetan culture. <laughs> I don't think they need to try mine. So let's see what uh, a Mark special Tibetan tea tastes like. Come on, Mark, you can do this. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Little less butter. Still very. It does actually. Want, uh, second time round, I was being a bit unfair over there. Cheers. <laughs> the Shangri-La outdoors, surrounded by animals, I really don't feel like I'm in China. I feel like maybe this is Germany or Switzerland or something. I've made a lot of good new friends today. So, uh, we're very good. <laughs> Sad to see them leave, huh? Let's go, let's go. <laughs> It's our second day on the road of this wonderful Chamaguda adventure. We've already had a few casualties, unfortunately, last night due to the altitude. Uh, four people apparently have been starting to feel slightly uh, ill. And uh, in these circumstances, we need to uh, slow them up straight away and they need to rest. But we've headed on, had a good bit of breakfast all morning, and now winding through the hills in what seems to be actually, we're about over three and a half thousand meters high. and. Uh, feels like we're heading up towards the clouds. Today, our first stop is the Napa High Nature Reserve, the largest area of grassland in the region. It's also where the rare black-necked cranes, of which only 6,000 remain in the world, come to winter. Apparently, in the past, other visitors have been here too, as the Magwotos used to bring their horses here to feed and rest. Time to get on a horse. This, stuff like this, really annoys me. We're in a place of immense beauty. I mean, immense beauty. And it's not like they get people around here coming to clean up every week. So we really should be careful about throwing stuff. But that said, have a look at where we are. Just look at this. It is absolutely breathtaking. And not just because we're at 4,250 meters, because 
obviously that does take away the breath as well but just the sheer beauty of it I just spent the last 30 minutes just taking pictures and taking and, and, and using my video camera it's it's amazing I guess we all have our own idea of what paradise is like but I'm sure few people would disagree that there's something quite enchanting about the tranquility and untouched beauty here. Next stop, the Pagoda Forest, a fantastic place to see the famous Meili Holy Mountain. And I can also burn some juniper incense, which Tibetans believe bring luck and prosperity. So, what I actually do is I put the put the uh, the leaves in here and make a wish. I prayed for a safe journey. Ooh, so I'm here in this wonderful little. Uh, sort of tower on the edge of a mountain uh, that's filled with Buddhist scriptures uh, that are put up here essentially to bring luck to travellers so that the wind passes through and brings luck. And over there, we can see the Meili Mountains. Everywhere you go in Tibetan inhabited areas, you'll see the bright prayer flags. The five colours correspond to different elements, earth, water, fire, cloud and sky. As someone with a fascination with borders, De Qing was for me a great place to come. There's Sichuan to the east, Tibet to the west, and Myanmar to the southwest. There's plenty of atmosphere, mainly thanks to the busy main road that dissects it. De Qing was probably best known for its many inns, where weary Magua Tos could take some well-deserved rest. Although a dozen ethnic groups call De Qing home, the county is 80% Tibetan, which creates a real cultural melting pot. Over a thousand years ago, the area was one of the main hubs of activity on the Tea and Horse Trail. Can you see that? Have you got as good a view as I have? The Mingyong Glacier is probably one of the most beautiful and awe-inspiring sights I've ever seen. At first, it looks like a river on the side of a mountain. It runs from a height of 5,500 metres above sea level, all the way down to 2,700 metres. That's only 800 metres above the Lansung River. It's one of the lowest altitude and lowest longitude glaciers in the world. Sadly though, this zigzagging ice dragon is now retreating 50 metres a year. At the foot of the Mignon Glacier, I find myself in the south of France. If you've read Lost Horizon, you'll know that the monks ate berries to maintain their health and stay young. The French missionaries who came here a hundred years or so ago appear to have had a similar idea as they planted grapes from which they naturally made wine. The vines were brought all the way from France to this region where almost every family started making its own wine. Who would imagine that in such a remote Chinese village, you'd find people drinking French wine every day. There are five major activities planned for the whole group during our tea and horse trail adventure. So now, it's game time. Okay, we're, we're playing a quick game now. What we've got five, five different glasses with wine and non-wines inside, okay? Three of them have been grown locally. Only one of them is over a year old. We have to find which one that is. Let's go and have a look. The group are taking their tasting very seriously. Although some of the tasting methods do seem a little unorthodox. And the more they drink, the more confused they become. You want to try? Want to try? This is where I swoop in with my highly refined palate. It's not number five. 
four is too light because the, the, the wines here, I've been told, are much darker. So that's an insider's tip. Three actually tastes all right. I was right. It's wine number three. There's a prize for the winner. A glass of fine wine bottled just ten days ago. Maybe I am French after all. 看到那美尼姐山,然后走到这个地方来,喝这个葡萄酒,觉得简直是太美好了。云彩离我都很近,好像是在云彩里喝酒的感觉。这边的酒有一股古朴的感觉,特别淳朴,就像这边的人民一样